Hello, everyone. My name is Veronica Torres. I am a program teaching staff member at the Cody Institute, and I have been at Cody for almost two years, and my uh, work has been focused on uh, the learning and research with a couple of programs we have at Cody. I am also have a lot of uh, experience over the last 20 years working on uh, strengthening skills of adolescents, particularly girls and young women as well, working in several countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Welcome everyone. Um, and hello everyone, my name is Addy. Uh, I also work here at the Cody Institute um, as a youth engagement specialist with the Center for Employment Innovation. Um, outside of my role here, however, uh, I'm very involved in uh, anti-sexual violence activism. Um, so very excited to, to be here, uh, part of uh, Cody's 16 Days event. Great, so I'm just going to um, start us off with um, our land acknowledgement and, um, and then we will go through and um, explain a little bit of what we're gonna to do today. So the Cody Institute operates on the ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, which holds a complex history of, of and continues to be impacted by exploitation, violence and colonization. We acknowledge Mi'kmaq and Willis Lee people as the original caretakers of the land and recognize the failure of colonial institutions and systems to maintain the treaties of peace and friendship that were intended to guide our presence here. In addition, we acknowledge the historical presence and contribution of African Nova Scotians and persons of African descent whose forced labor played a significant role in forming the foundations of this province and whose own relationship with land has been complicated by the impacts of slavery and colonization. Race and indigeneity have been used as tools to oppress and repress various communities across these lands, and the intentional and unintentional maintenance of otherness continues to cause harm and contribute, contribute to the grief and trauma of historically excluded groups. We acknowledge that we can't speak about sexual or gender-based violence without acknowledging, unpacking, and actively addressing the ongoing non-consensual relationship Canada has with Indigenous peoples or the significantly higher rates of sexual violence faced by Black communities. As an organization, we take responsibility for learning and seeking long-term transformation in our relationship with land and labor in our province, and we encourage you to do the same. I'll now hand over to Addie. Before we uh, get to introducing our wonderful panelists, uh, we did also want to share a little bit about what uh, 16 Days of Activism is and what that means. Um, so the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence is an annual international campaign that runs from November 25th which is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women uh, until December 10th, which is World Human Rights Day. In Canada, that 16 days also encompasses the anniversary of the Montreal Massacre, uh, an anti-feminist mass shooting that occurred on December 6th, 1989 at L'École Polytechnique de Montréal, killing 14 women and injuring 14 others. The 16 Days campaign started in 1991 as a way to speak out against issues of gender-based violence and continues to be used by activists around the world to draw attention to what's happening in their countries and their communities. This year, St. FX University has chosen the theme, The Right to Choose Safely, uh, for their 16 Days campaign in response to the various attacks on women's right to choose in social, political, and religious spheres. So for those of you joining from SynFX, um, there will be other events uh, happening over the course of the 16 days. Uh, most of those are located in the Bloomfield Center around lunchtime. Um, so feel free to, to check all of those out throughout uh, this campaign as well. Thanks, Addie. So I'd like to uh, welcome our two uh, 
fabulous uh, panelists who are from uh, Ghana and Zimbabwe, two, um, two different countries in, on the African continent who are, have tr done tremendous work in this field. And I am going to take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about them and their work. Uh, Vera Okema Aguye, and I'm sure I didn't say that properly, so my apologies is a professional social worker and gender advocate working with International Needs Ghana, who designs and implements interventions targeted at empowering children, adolescents and families and communities to take action to end child and adolescent protection violations and harmful practices. Through trainings, workshops, consultative meetings, community and district level engagements and media advocacy, she creates platforms to initiate, reflect, learn, share ideas, and take action towards societal and behavioral change. Uh, she's a very busy woman. She has very little time, so we're just so pleased that she's uh, able to join us today. Thank you, Vera. And Saliwe and Saliwe is based in uh, Zimbabwe, and I am going to have the pleasure of seeing her in a couple months, in uh, January, as I head to Zimbabwe as well. Uh, Saliwe is the founding director of the Talia Women's Network, an organization that exists to empower women and girls, inspire change and trans transform lives. Talia brings economic and social opportunities that facilitate the development of large scale positive change through programs that allow women and girls to re realize their potential. So Leeway's role within the organization is in fundraising and resource mobilization, responding to calls for proposals, creating relationships with potential funders, private sector partners, and finding innovative ways to, to um, build the organization and its programs. She's an amazing leader and she has a lot of experience in Zimbabwe. So we are also just very pleased we could have time with Saliwe as well. Thank so you. So the way we're going to move forward is we're going to take uh, a few minutes to ask Vera and Saliwe some questions that we prepared. We will then have a question and answer period and then have some closing words. So hopefully uh, you you as you listen to these amazing women, you have some questions that you would also like to ask. So um, I would, I'm going to start by asking each of Vera and Saliwe to just share briefly, um, introduce their work they do uh, in their countries and uh, to tell us why they do this work. So I will start with Vera and if Vera, if you could um, go ahead and tell us in about five minutes, what what kind of work you do uh, and why you do this work in Ghana. Thank you, Veronica. And um, I'm really honored to be sharing this space with all of you. My name is Vera Elikem Awie, and I'm Ghanaian. I'm the last of five siblings. And um, I'm going to start with why I do this work. Uh, at a very early age, uh, I lost my dad to prostate cancer. Um, that was just when I was about 13 years old. I thought that that was traumatic enough until a few days after that, um, people were in my house to throw my mom and us out of the house uh, for property and uh, land ownership rights. And so that was my first experience to gender-based violence. And um, just after my dad had passed, watching my mom give up on her economic ventures to take care of my dad who was really ill. Um, and sometimes it's just really difficult that even after you lose the person, it's difficult to come back on your feet. And then looking at the fact that there were no structures or sh enough structures that were you know, strong enough to help such women come back on their feet was something that really motivated me at that early time. But then I had my sister who was empowered at that time who stood in for us. And so I was able to see the two sides of vulnerability and empowerment. And at a very early age, I was able to understand those two experiences. And somehow as fate would have it, 
I found myself being a social worker um, now. And so I work with International News Ghana, like you rightly said, currently a senior programs officer and the team lead for gender. Being a social worker for me is not just a career or profession. Being a social worker is just me living my life every day, um, trying to see that more girls and women are empowered, um, are able to make informed decisions about their lives and are able to participate in their own protection. So like you rightly said, since then I've been involved in implementing and designing interventions to deal with abuse, exploitation, violence, and harmful practices. I'm a trainer. I train community level and district level officers with tools that you know communities can relate to easily to deal with some of these issues. I work strengthening families and helping them the, the need to invest in girls so that they can you know, reach their full potential. I promote reproductive health and rights and also work to prevent sexual and gender-based violence in communities. I'm also engaged in media advocacy. And the interesting thing for me is that I also get to promote the use of reusable sanitary pads, especially in this global economic crisis where menstrual hygiene has become you know, a global issue. And currently in Ghana, um, access to sanitary pads has become probably four times or three times more expensive than it used to be. So promoting the reusable parts gives girls a chance, you know, to end period poverty and transactional poverty. I am guided by the values of non-discrimination, inclusivity, respect for all, and most importantly, the best interest of the child. And finally, coming to Cody, wow, uh, it was phenomenal. It's It's been an experience that has changed my my work, my thinking, my perspectives. And um, thanks to Sarika, Eileen, Erin, everybody, you know, for making our state very impactful. And I remember I would normally call myself a gender enthusiast until Sarika made me realize that I wasn't just a gender enthusiast, but I was unapologetically a feminist as well. So today I'm glad to be here and um, to share this space with all of you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vera. Um, so my name is Saliwe Mchitwa, and um, I'm the founding director of Talia Women's Network, which is based in Harare, Zimbabwe. So Talia for me, it's not work. Um, Talia is my passion. It's a passion project. Talia is my calling. And I also tell people that Talia is my ministry. This is how I minister to women and girls. Um, the journey for Talia for us began in 2008 when um, my husband and I found ourselves unemployed and living in a home with no electricity and no running water. I had been working on a consulting project in the NGO sector and the NGO sector in our country, you get in contract and out of contract. So at that time, I was out of contract. Um, my husband as well was working in a different city, um, about five hours away from us, um, the rest of the family. And during that time, we experienced some personal problems as well. And so we made the decision for him to quit his job and relocate back to Harare for us because we prioritized our marriage and our family that came first to us. So because of those circumstances, we were both unemployed. We wouldn't know where our next meal would come from. But it was a good time for us, good in the sense that we got to bond and it also drove us to seek our passion and seek our purpose in life. And it was through moments of prayer, of reflection, that the idea of Talia was born, that we wanted to impact vulnerable women and girls in Zimbabwe. So how we do this, um, so though the journey started in 2009, it only materialized much, much later. From 2009, when eventually we got back into um, employment, registered the organization, what our, our involvement with women and girls was really on in the menstrual hygiene space, um, similar to what Vera said, um, just trying to keep the girls in school and pro providing with menstrual hygiene products and other products that they need. I remember the first outreach that we did in the year 2012, where I had purchased so many um, um, disposable pads and I thought I'll just go and just 
you know, drop them off at the village where I was going into. But then I got there, the, the, the headmaster who was responsible for those girls, there were about 80 girls, said, they're waiting for you, come and speak to them. And I didn't know what to say to them. But it was in those conversations that the idea of Talia was solidified because I realized that they needed much more than menstrual hygiene products. The young girls, the young women, they needed career guidance. They had issues that they were dealing with. And over the years, repeatedly we would go into various communities with menstrual hygiene products. So when in 2018, I decided to work on Talia full time, when we were designing our strategy, it was trying to see how to make it more sustainable. Because through our experiences, we knew that after a few months, they would be calling us back once their supplies ran out. So in building the element of sustainability, firstly, we also started looking at the reusable pads because they are more durable, they are more hygienic, and they last longer. But then we also found ways of economically empowering the women and girls so that they wouldn't turn to anyone for whether it's menstrual hygiene products or, or any other needs that they had. And that, that would reduce their vulnerability to unscrupulous people, even politicians, or people who wanted to take advantage of them. So how we do this, Talia is seeking to improve the lives of vulnerable women and girls in Zimbabwe through three main pillars that we focus on. We focus on education and leadership development. We also focus on economic empowerment and livelihoods. And the third pillar is on um, sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, we are working mostly in the rural communities in Zimbabwe. 80% um, of our beneficiaries are in the rural communities and they rely on agriculture for their livelihoods. These are women with a low educational attainment. These are women with limited ac access to economic opportunities. And also they are also victims of early and childhood marriages. So these are the women that we are serving through the programs that we run as Talia Women's Network. Thank you. Thank you both. It was wonderful to hear about the, the work that you're doing. Um, so we're gonna shift, shift gears a little bit with our next question uh, to look at the theme uh, for uh, the 16 Days campaign here at Santa Fe. Um, so we're curious to know in each of your contexts, if you can tell us how you think about the concept of safety uh, and then also about the concept of choice. So what those two things mean uh, to you folks within that work that you're doing. Um, uh, maybe we'll we'll go in the same order again, uh, so that silly way you're not uh, uh, talking for too long at the same time. Okay, um, so the concept of safety and choice, I'll start with safety. And for me, when I think about safety, I think of me first, and then I think of every other person. Because if I am safe and every other person is not safe, then I am really not safe. And I want to share an experience that happened to me just two nights ago. Like I mentioned, I'm nine hours away from home. And about 3, 10 a.m. in the morning at dawn, I hear my, my door open and there was a man standing over my bed, you know, and that was very scary for me. And I, I woke up and I was frightened and he left. How he entered my room, I do not know. I was so scared and I still feel unsafe, even as I sit here, you know. So safety for me is being in total peace of mind with my body, with my spirit, with my mind, and in federance to that in, in my environment and also, you know, with my beliefs as well. Um, safety for me is being unafraid. Safety for me is living in an environment where there's no violence, living with people who are free to live their potentials to, you know, to the highest level. That is safety for me, a life where you can speak your mind, you can share your opinions without being judged, without being, you know, in fear of being attacked, um, without, you know, going to school and being afraid of being abducted or a bomb or a gunshot from somewhere coming to just end your life. Um, it's also the thing about just living your childhood, you know, and enjoying that space to be able to grow to become, uh, you know, uh, a responsible adult in future. Um, it's also about, you know, wearing what you want to wear and not being uh, raped or being defiled because of what you, you wore, you know, and that we can move beyond some of these um, uh, perspectives and just live in a society that is free, 
that is fair and where there's no fear. Um, coming to the, the, the concept of choice, for me, again, choice is the biggest gift we have as human beings. It's the, gift, the biggest gift I have because then I'm able to make decisions for myself and I'm also able to you know, participate in my own uh, protection. Choice gives me the opportunities and the options to choose from a variety of uh, decisions that I have to make and choose the best option um, that works for me. That is choice for me. And looking at my environment, even though you know there, there are options, but how well does it work in our favor? When we look at the issue of education, how many people do have that choice or that option or that space to get the education that you know everyone deserves and especially for women and girls you know we have a system where as, so for instance in Ghana there's been a lot of campaign to promote education you know and um, now we have a lot of girls in school but as you go higher to the senior high school levels to the university levels you realize that then the numbers keep declining as well I don't think that that gives us a lot of choice also the issue of land and property ownership. How many women you know, own lands and own properties in our society? This doesn't give us opportunity to realize equity. Again, in the area of reproductive health, access to reproductive health facilities and, and commodities, do women really have a choice to make those decisions? Recently, I met a couple and the man has refused to talk to his wife because the wife went on uh, a family planning journey uh, without him. The woman also claims that she's had too many children and the, the husband just doesn't understand the implications of their life. Do women still have choices in these areas? Uh, when it comes to marriage and when it comes to child marriage, FGM, which is affecting over 130 million people, you know, do we really have a choice to say that we do not want these for us and we want a better life? that society gave us those, um, those opportunities. So um, these are you know, thoughts that come to my head when I think about choice, whether we really have power over our choices and, um, um, and how we go about them. We have, in Ghana, we have a situation where we, we, we have these witch camps to the extent that women do not even want to move out of these witch camps because they feel more safe in the witch camps. And when you hear about witch camps, you're like, oh, people shouldn't be in these areas. But we have a society that has you know, made these witch camps even more safe for these women than to come back to society to be integrated. I don't think that it's a, their choice to be there, but somehow society has been able you know, to push them to that area where they've had to make a decision to be in some of these areas. So um, lots of issues we can talk about when it comes to making choices, but I do not think that we are there yet where women especially are able to make you know, full choices for themselves. So um, when I hear the word safety, what immediately comes to mind is the absence of fear. It's, um, you know, it's many things that come to mind. It's the reduction of gender-based violence, it's um, removing the fear from crime, you know, like the example that Vera just gave. It's, it's just not living in fear. It, I think of creating safe spaces, particularly for women and girls, for them to fully and freely express themselves. I think of um, providing them with the comforts that they need in life, um, discouraging violence, financial security even, mental well-being, because your mental health is equally as important. You know, just living free from violence, from harassment, from discrimination. When I also think of the concept of safety, safety has to do a lot with access. Um, access to education, access to healthcare, access to economic opportunities, all those things that give the women the, the needed, much needed security blanket. So safety, it also brings to mind the concept of space, you know, safety in your intimate space, in your home, and safety as you move into the public spaces. So all those are things that I think of in terms of women and girls and safety for them. And looking at the concept of choice now, 
choice for me is just the freedom to make your own decisions for your own life. You know, women and girls, particularly, they should have the rights, they should have the ability to choose the best life for themselves. So it becomes a very interesting concept for me living in the society that I live in. You know, it's a really patriarchal society. We have strong cultural and traditional values. So I then start to think that, you know, women and girls, you know, they can sail through life just living according to the expectations of society or family expectations or cultural expectations without really making choices pertaining to aspects of their lives. And when I think of choice, you know, we can talk of the whole list of things that women should, should be able to choose from. But, you know, I feel that women and girls particularly, they should be trusted to be guided by their own personal values to make sound decisions for their lives. When I also think of the concept of choice, I think of ownership. The reason why I look and weep at the women and girls in my country, in my society, the ones that we serve, is because the concept of ownership and power is not there. It's, it's as if you can ask yourself, who do I belong to? Do I belong to me? I cannot make choices for my own life because my life is not my own, to say that in the list. You know, even your body, we talk about reproductive rights. How many children should I have? When should I have children in that space? Women cannot make those choices because someone else owns your body. We talk about land, property rights. You can't make choices for your own empowerment, your own advancement, your own legacy that you're trying to build because of the patriarchal society. Someone else owns the land, owns the assets. So all those issues, that's what brings the contradiction between looking at the right to choose, looking at the concept of safety, and also trying to see how applicable they are in the society that we live. Great ladies. Well, you've made me change my last question because you're so thoughtful and uh, forward looking. Um, but I wanted you to answer very quickly this one question I have because we talk about all of these issues that girls and young women are facing around these concepts of choice and safety. And I want to ask you if you could, if you had the, the resources and power to make one thing happen in each of your countries, what would, you, what would it be around the ability of girls and young women to make uh, choices safely? And um, Saliwe, I'll start with you. So again, one thing. So I want you to keep it very brief in terms of what, what you would want to have happen. So if I had the resources and coming to, you know, spending time with you and Sarika in, in, um, in the Global Leadership Program, um, one thing that I would want to see happen is for us to empower women and girls. And by empowerment, I'm looking at um, building their capacity because we talk about rights, but most of them are not even aware of their rights. So how do we empower them to be able to make their own decisions concerning their own lives? We see many programs that come into our communities. They, um, they come with solutions, but we need to reach a point where we empower them to be able to find their own solutions for the problems that they are facing. So for me, it's about empowering the women and girls to give them the courage. Courage, Veronica, to stand up for their own rights, courage to be able to leave abusive relationships if they need to, you know, prioritize their own physical health, their own mental health, the courage to pursue their dreams and to fulfill their potential, empower them to, to have the courage to build their legacy. And I think one phrase that I left Cody with, empower them to have the courage to speak even when their voices are shaking. I, I would not you. take yeah I would not take anything out of uh, what Saliwe just said because I was just thinking around those same lines. If I had all the resources, I would invest all of it into empowerment. I would want to see children at a very young age being taught to be assertive because once they are assertive, they are able to speak 
you know, and amplify their voices on issues. They are confident about the things that they want. They know what their rights are. They can see abuse and determine it and, you know, and, and say that we do not want to be part of this and we do not want to be the abusers as well. They can make decisions and, you know, and avoid going to jail. We have lots of young people going to jail these days. It shouldn't be the case. Young people need to make economic decisions right from the beginning. Not just saying that I want to be a teacher, I want to be a doctor because those are the one society and the book say, but knowing from the beginning that this is really what I want and working towards it. And so if you ask me that if I had resources, where would I put it in? I'll put it in empowerment, but more specifically at a very, very young age. I wouldn't want any child to grow up to the age that I was and have the, some of the experiences that I had before experiencing assertiveness. Right from the beginning, it's a, it's, it's a go-go for me. Thank you both. Thank you so much. So I think we're going to now shift over to questions from the, the participants of the webinar. Well, oh, and I see our first question uh, coming in. Um, so I'll put this out and then you folks can decide between yourselves who wants to answer first. Um, and the question is how to stop politicians while they are taking, making wrong decisions uh, about female lives or prohibiting women uh, from having access to basic rights. So when I look at, at my situation, and I think this is the popular situation in most African countries, um, the political space is a very scary one to deal with. And um, it all goes back to the issue that I spoke about of empowering women and girls. Because um, particularly like in my country, we are leading up to an election year. And we see that um, they, they prey on the vulnerable for them to be able to get votes, for example. They come with food aid, they come and dangle all sorts of things that, um, that they see that there is a need for in the communities. And so going back to the issue of really empowering people in the communities, once they are empowered, they are able to make better decisions for themselves. For example, if we empower them with education and economic opportunities, they won't be looking for handouts. They won't be looking for someone to pay for their health bill or their medical bills. So for me, it's about building the capacity of the women at the grassroots level, of the communities at the grassroots, the grassroots levels, so that they are able to sustain themselves. And once you they are able to sustain themselves, you take the power away from the from the politician. Because when they come with these things, I already have them. I already need them. And besides, when I'm empowered and I'm at a particular level economically, I can make a decision of who I want to be the next leader in our village, in our community, and in our society. So that's the first thing that I feel that if we empower them at that level, at grassroots level, they'll be able to speak out and make the right decisions. Then it also goes back, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but we need to give women the voice. In our patriarchal societies, we have achieved that women can vote, women can select leaders, but it's still not so open for women to participate in this political space as well. We need to empower women so that they take up these positions because when women are in power, they are better able to represent the needs of other women and girls. So we need to be able to build their capacity so that they take up these leadership positions and become the leaders themselves. And so that they are able to stand up against um, the discrimination and the violence that's happening against women, other women and girls. And then thirdly, I think we need to give them the support that they need. The institutions are supposed to be there to support the women. The institutions are supposed to be nonpartisan. You know, if women are being violated in the communities because of politicians, whatever type of violation, they need to have a safe space or a safe institution where they can go and, and report these cases and they see the recourse of whatever uh, the, the violation happened against them. So it goes back to giving the power to the people where, who who really need to take the power and giving them the courage and the voice to be able to stand up for themselves. That's how we can neutralize the harmful and the detrimental impact of the politicians over, over our lives. We need to get to a point where we are not afraid to die. I look at 
the liberation struggle in Zimbabwe, for example, we have we had women at the forefront fighting for the freedom of this country. So what is to stop women from fighting for where we are today and not be taken advantage of by the politicians? So I, I, I want to emphasize that in dealing with these political issues, that numbers are important. Numbers are important. But most importantly, uh, most important, you know, apart from the numbers, if we have the numbers, is knowledge. So we could have the numbers, but if they do not have the knowledge, then there's still a very big gap. So numbers and then the knowledge matters. We are striving for a society that is not matriarchal. We do want to get rid of patriarchy, but you know we are not looking for matriarchy. Uh, what Sarika taught us, and I, I absolutely agree, is that we want a society where there's equality. You know, so that's what we are fighting for. And to talk about education, for me, education is beyond the classroom. There are people who have never sat in the classroom but they are very, very intelligent and have answers to a lot of these things. I would like to say that we need the numbers and we need the voice. We need to push for affirmative action. These are things that a lot of countries are struggling with. It has to move. We need to push for affirmative action so that women have the numbers, women have the voice, you know, and we are united to push these agendas. We can't have men talking about menstruation. They probably know about menstruation, but they do not know how it feels and what you need to do when you're menstruating. They probably have heard that sanitary pads are expensive, but they do not know how much we need the sanitary pads. Someone would say that condoms you know, are, are cheap and sanitary pads are more expensive, but menstruation is biological and sex is a choice. We need to talk about these issues and these are political issues that we need to deal with. We need the numbers. We need women in decision-making positions to be able to deal with these numbers. And so for me, I will talk about, you know, one, women supporting women to get the numbers. Sometimes amongst women ourselves, we end up just pulling each other down, each other down and fighting each other. This is not the time for doing that. The time is to gather ourselves so that we can have the loudest voice, you know, and the, and the biggest strategies. And so for me, once again, it's about getting the numbers. It's about building the knowledge base, whether it's an informal or formal sectors. It's about uniting, pushing the agenda for affirmative action and letting men know that we can make our own decisions because we are affected by the issues the most. Wonderful. Thank you both for those, those really great answers. Um, we have another question uh, that came in through our Q&A function, uh, which is from Helena. Um, and she's asking, cultural norms and traditions tend to challenge empowered women and girls uh, who are often accused of being disrespectful. What is your experience in empowering men so that they are able to resonate better with empowered women and girls? So when I, I look at the work that we do in, at, at Talia Women's Network in the communities, we are targeting the women and girls for the opportunities, economic empowerment, education, but we also respect the spaces that we are working in. And that deals a lot with the engagement of men and boys. So um, one reason why our program has been successful is because we do not isolate the women um, at the expense of the men and boys. So it's clear for for, for them, for the men, why women are participating in the programs. Because once we, I, if we were to take the approach of isolating them and just saying we are doing this for the women, you know, there would be so much resistance. But in my, in our experiences, it's very important for us to engage them, to communicate clearly why we are working with the women in their empowerment initiatives, and also to be transparent in everything that we do. So it's not some secret society. We might be a women-based organization, but it's not something that is a secret society. So we do have dialogue sessions where we work even with the men, identifying the issues that are affecting the women and girls and trying to make them see that this is how our programs are going to be addressing all those issues. So we have testimonies from men, from husbands 
who at first were resistant to having their women attend some of these um, these programs and these um, these initiatives. But once they saw the benefit, and that the benefit is not just for the woman alone. When we empower a woman economically and she she has that financial security, when we empower a woman and she can make good choices and good decisions, it's not for her own benefit, but it's also for the benefit of the family and the community at large. So even in our mission, we actually do say for them to have successful futures for themselves and their communities. So the women, men need to see that we are not working in isolation. Like Vera mentioned that we are not trying to get rid of patriarchy by creating matriarchy, but we want to bring equality. So because women are several steps behind, we are working with women to bring them to a position of equality. But it doesn't mean that the men do not have an equally important role to play in the society and in the community. So making them understand this, communicating clearly and engaging them and also helping them as they identify, particularly with cultural practices, even in my own culture, we've got several cultural practices that with time, they are also seeing the harmful effects with cultural practices with, with regards to reproductive rights, cultural practices with regards to inheritance laws. Pre previously, when a husband died, there was another you know, the brother or an uncle would inherit the wife and the children. But then came HIV and AIDS. We saw that this was such a, you know, a detriment to society in, its, in itself because you are going to inherit the wife. Maybe she's already got HIV positive and it spreads within the families. So as you are communicating, they also try start to identify that we should not stick to the old way of doing things just because we did them previously. But as we engage them in everything that we are doing, they also appreciate um, you know, the benefits that will accrue not just to the woman, but also to the whole family at large. Okay, so um, the line was breaking when the, the question was asked a bit, so I didn't get a full component, but uh, from Saliway's submission, I'm guessing that we are also talking about partnerships uh, when it comes to men and boys, if, if I'm right. Yes, yeah, so I engaged, um, I, I engaged a lot of boys and recently I engaged them in a conversation about you know, reproductive health, SGBV, and some of the submissions I got were very interesting. Uh, some of the boys told me that they know that there's an injection for girls that make them, you know, have delivery so easy and so fast. And so they don't think that adolescents go through pain or they are at risk of adolescent pregnancy. Um, some also did not know that if they defiled a girl or raped a girl, they, they could go to prison in Ghana's law up to 27 years. Um, they also felt that uh, when an adolescent girl girl gets pregnant, um, the boys suffer the most and not the girls because the boys have to find uh, money and take care of the children. So basically you can see that there's really a shift, you know, there's a mindset that is really at par um, when it comes to what is going on between, you know, girls and boys and then with men and women. For me, engaging men and boys and then, you know, empowering women and girls, it's not a competition. For me, it's a partnership and we need that partnership. It's very important that we are able to agree on certain things. So for instance, if a woman feels that I'm at a point where I need to go and get family planning, I mean, a man should be able to understand from her perspective and not lord over her and say that maybe I'm the man, you can't do this because it's her body. We should be able to get to that point where we have these uh, conversations. Again, it's really important that we, 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 we engage men and boys because, and especially these Boys go to become men and then they marry girls and if they do not know how to, you know, be responsible men, they end up abusing them and sometimes they, so for me, um, we need to, girls have been empowered and boys have been neglected. And for him, one of the things he said is that he doesn't even get to wear underpants or he's wearing very torn underpants. Even his hygiene issues, brushing his teeth and you know, just using deodorant sprays are things that have been neglected and you know, all the attention is on the girls. But for them as well, you know, these are very important issues. And so we brought these issues up at the panel and it's also been taken up there and seriously. If we really want to see a society that is safe, we want to see a society that is equal, 
as much as we are empowering girls, which I am absolutely a champion and an ambassador for it, we need to also change the narrative for boys to unlearn some negative practices, relearn, you know, positive practices, and they themselves should even champion some of the patriarchal practices that are in our society if we really want to see change in our community. So I am for engaging boys as well, because like I said, it's not a competition, it is not a war, we just want a just and safe environment. Thank you both. And I think we have time for one more very quick uh, question. So uh, after I ask this next question, I'll ask you to keep your answers short so we have time for our closing. Um, and this question is, how do we uh, increase the participation of women from ethnic minorities in politics? Uh, because without political participation, how can they raise their issues to government? So, okay, um, okay Saliwe, please go. Okay, I was going to say, I, I come from an ethnic minority myself. Uh, our tribe is called the Ndau tribe, and it's one of the smallest tribes in our country. And um, sometimes I shudder at when I look at our representation in political spaces, um, because we are not represented enough. But then when I look at this, I also think to myself that who did I want to represent me? <laughs> who knows how to speak for me more than I do? So as we are building the capacity, I keep going back to this. I think women need to develop the boldness and the confidence to stand up in these spaces. I think we need to get to a point where um, people, women, particularly in girls in the ethnic minorities, need to appreciate that they are equal, they are also as capable as everyone else and 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 so they should also stand up for their own rights in their own spaces as we create safe spaces for them we should encourage them to take up these spaces i think we can also encourage them through um, role modeling um, we need a lot of role models because that's one thing that's lacking in our society. It might not be from the exact same tribe, but if they see and hear the stories that are being shown from women in other ethnic minorities from across the globe who have stood up and, and who have taken up these spaces, they will be able to see and realize that I can do this as well. So role models and mentoring and coaching, all those are things that we need to incorporate as we are mentor, as we are building the capacity of the women and girls, even from a young age. So that's one thing I think we need also need to focus on as we are encouraging them to take up, um, to take up space, particularly in the political arena. And I think it's for us all to realize that we have a role to play because when we look at all these issues, we may think someone else should come and do this for us. Someone else should come and empower our girls. Someone else should come and, and talk to them and build their capacity and be that role model. But each and every one of us, particularly even on this call, we have an important role to play. And if we play our roles right, we'll be able to uplift the lives of these women, even in these ethnic minorities, so that they take up space. So we need to take up our own space for them to be able to see and take up space as well. And finally, it's not that we don't have women in ethnic minorities who are not taking up space, but it's just that we are not hearing these stories. I keep saying, who's narrative and whose stories are we listening to or are we reading? We need to empower our women and girls to tell our own stories and to tell them out loudly because we are just re reading things that are written by the global north or by the system which is patriarchal and they want to silence our voices. But if we start telling our own stories and our own narratives, we've got powerful women in these ethnic minorities but their stories are not heard. So we need to start telling their stories because these stories are going to inspire the next woman to take up space. I would add up to say that irrespective of who we are or where we come from, we need our voices heard and we need to be seen. Even from a place of invisibility, we still need our voices heard. That's the only way everyone and people would know that we do exist and that we want support to actually be represented. So for me, you might be an ethnic minority. And I mean, um, I, I, I can say I also belong to you know, a minority group as well. Uh, 
but that doesn't stop me from making my opinions heard. Um, it doesn't stop me from you know being seen. I believe that once I put my voice out there, uh, I might be intimidated, but my voice would linger. So I believe that we really need to make our voices heard from wherever we are coming from. Even though we are being intimidated, let's keep speaking up on the issues. There are issues that have been resolved today. For instance, if you take that issue like child marriage, okay. Child marriage is a practice that has existed for decades and decades and decades. And this is, was seen as something that was normal. You know, and till then, there are certain um, religions and tribes that still practice child marriage. But over the years, because everyone, people started talking about it, and you would be surprised that it was probably even a minority group that probably was talking about that. Over the years, we have all seen reason that child marriage has to end now. So I believe that we need to keep talking. We need to keep, you know, doing things to be visible. And we need to keep, you know, rallying support. We will get there. It doesn't look perfect right now, but one day our children will come and enjoy just because we spoke up. Wonderful. Thank you both again. Um, I think Veronica is gonna gonna ask one more thing in closing and then we will be yeah. Well, I really appreciate your wisdom and your thoughtful responses, Liwe and Vera. I think that um the Participants in today's panel have really appreciated your uh, thoughtfulness about safety and choice and about voice uh, and coming at voice from different sides. So I, I know you've spoken a great deal about these different issues, but I wanted to have some final words from each of you around this topic and what would it what would you say to everyone who's online right now uh, in closing? So if we could start with Vera. Um, I'll just briefly say that, um, like I said, I come from Ghana and Ghana has made some progress uh, when it comes to some of these issues we are talking about. We have the interstate succession law that protects women when it comes to property rights. Uh, we have institutions like the Domestic Violence and Victim Support Unit that's doing a good job. There's increased awareness, but there's so much more to do. We have signed legislatures and all that. And together we are all still working at making sure that we are all safe and we all have choices. However, I would like to say that no one is really safe until we are all safe. We need to keep investing in advocacy. We need to keep training and mentoring the young ones to be empowered, to be assertive, You know, showing them the way to, to be able to find their feet at a very early age. And so we are all not safe until everyone is safe. Thank you. So for me, women empowerment is not just a buzzword. It's not just a catchphrase that we just want to throw around right now, but it's something that's really crucial, particularly in the times that you're living in. Um, when you talk of the right to choice, um, when you talk about all these issues that are affecting vulnerable women and girls, you know, it comes, you know, the solution for me comes in empowering our women, empowering our girls in our communities. So an empowered woman has the freedom to make the right choices. So if we empower them, they are able to make better choices for themselves, for their bodies, for their families, and for their communities as well. But we also need to support women. I think as we invest in women empowerment, we also need to support them, whether you're male or female, because um, like Vera mentioned earlier, it's all about a partnership. We need to empower them and we need to support them so that they are able to reach their full potential. As we build the capacity of these women, then we will expect them and we will know that they will be able to make the right choices. And right now we've made great strides. I think uh, all across the globe, we've got, we've got so many movements that we can talk about of how women's lives have been made better, how we are uplifting the lives of women and girls, particularly in the education space, economic empowerment, in the political spaces. But we now need to build their capacity so that as they take up space, they'll be able to be to add more value to the spaces that they occupy. Um, and so as my final words are, as we are going through these 16 days of activism, um, as we talk about giving women the choice, the right to choice and freedom and empowerment, it's not someone else's responsibility. 
we all have an important role to play. So as we go through the 16 days, let's also take it as a moment of personal reflection. What am I doing to uplift the lives of women and girls around me? What am I doing to support the next woman who I meet or who is around the corner? What am I doing to be that role model or to be that support system so that collectively we are able to, um, to achieve the, the end result that we all need to? Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, and thank you for really uh, being such great resources on this day and uh, appreciate the, the thoughtfulness again of, of your words. And thanks to everyone who's attended today and who has also been commenting and reflecting on the in the chat and and also asking such um, great questions of our panelists. Uh, we want to say thanks again. And hopefully, if you would like to see this, it, there will be a recording and it will be online in the next few days. Thanks to everyone also from the communications team who helped support this. And, uh, and we'll... Um, let you go. Thank you, uh, Vera and Taliwe and Addie, for all your great help. And uh, we'll be on again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.